So survivalism isn't just some moron running around the woods shooting at targets with his AR-15 waiting for the zombie apocalypse so he can prove how much of a man he is. It's far more complicated than that. All right, let's do this. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today I wanna to talk about why do you wanna survive? That is the question. I think there's a lot of people who have a really primitive understanding of what it means to be a survivalist. The goal of this video is to give you a definition of survivalism which is more philosophically profound. Because I don't just think the point of prepping for collapse is purely motivated by some sort of desire to be king shit of the post-apocalypse. Now, we've talked about on this channel before, there's a basic psychology that says that people imagine this stuff because for whatever reasons, they weren't able to achieve what they wanted to while the grid was up. So they want to reset so that they can start anew and you know prove themselves in that regard. There's also another theory that would suggest that people uh, have never had to prove themselves in this society in which the Darwinian laws of uh, survival of the fittest no longer apply and uh, the alpha beta hierarchies are definitely not what they would be in the natural world, meaning that in the natural world, the people who are running the show now, which is basically the wealthy tech nerds, uh, would not be obviously running the show, that they are standing on the shoulders of many other social institutions which first had to be in place before they could rise to power. I'm going to read you some stuff that I've contemplated. So there's more to survivalism than just fear. I do believe that there's more to it than just I want to run into the woods and have this primitive self-reliant existence where I'm king of nothing. And it's birthed from an instinct we all have deep within us that we know that the winter is coming. So what I mean by that is that in times gone by, the winter came and people had to prepare for it. So prepping is inherent in our genes. In fact, all species that are not migratory are preppers you know, squirrels, beavers, bears, all species who have to hunker down for the winter have some component of their, of their behavior which could be construed as preparedness, whether it's fattening up for the winter, storing walnuts, or, you know, building a beaver dam, building a bird's nest, whatever the case might be, animals prepare. We prepared at one point. But now with the advent of technology and climate control and food which is shipped from 5,000 miles away, we don't need to prepare for the winter anymore. In fact, there's places like in Calgary. In Calgary, every all the buildings downtown are connected. So you can basically live inside and never have to go outside. So winter, theoretically, you would never even have to experience it. You could live an entire winter with ever stepping foot outside some cities, even in the coldest cities in Canada. We don't have to prepare for that anymore, but that is still in our genes. That's still something we are wired for. So it's in our genes to be preppers. So modern civilization, we never experienced true scarcity, but we all imagine that it's coming. So there's this deep, deep fear within us all that it could come and that it's just around the corner. So if survivalism emerged as a response to human beings' dependency on technology and its underlying post-industrial socio-economic framework for their survival. So what I mean by that is that the more technologically advanced we get, the more this deep-seated fear within us that we are drifting very, very far from the shore into uncharted territory becomes more distinct with some people, not all. Now, maybe you could argue that there is something genetic which unites all people of the preparedness mindset. Maybe there's some, you know, gene we all share. 
um, that would be an interesting study to explore in itself. So a good metaphor to understand this is imagine you were on this beautiful island that provided you with everything you needed, but it kept you in a state of arrested development. You couldn't really evolve technologically on this island because as much as it provided you everything you needed, you know, there was no iron ore, there was no uh, challenges and conflicts and uh, colder climate that would force you to really develop tools and, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention. If there's no necessity to invent, then it becomes very challenging to do so. So imagine you get a boat and uh, you venture out to sea and as you go further and further away from this island, it gets more and more dangerous. But at the same time, the possibilities open up more and more. You know, there's more and more things that present themselves, but you're further and further away from home. So as much as there's more technological possibility, you become increasingly more vulnerable in a survival sense. Another metaphor to understand this is say that you are a little plant and you are growing uh, under an overhang, whether maybe it was a rock or, you know, another tree or something like that. And that provided a good canopy. So you didn't get scorched by the sun. You know, you didn't get eaten by a deer that walked by or trampled on anything. You could grow there securely, but you would grow in a bonsai state because of course you'd be limited in the, in the sunlight, the amount of nutrients. So you could, you could grow there, but you'd only grow to a certain extent. Your growth would be stunted, but it would be guaranteed. In many cases, that's much of what survivalism is, but it's deeper than that. It's more meaningful than that. And I'm going to get to that if you bear with me. Now, survivalism emerges as insurance against the inevitable collapse of civilization along the current socioeconomic trajectory. Whether that's a Malthusian catastrophe with the food system, economic collapse, global climate disruption, or a global war for resources, if we continue right now along this trajectory, one of these things is mathematically guaranteed to take us out. It's just a mathematical fact because in all of our systems right now, they are not sustainable systems. So it's going to happen. Survivalists seek to become more self-reliant as a means of protecting themselves from the vulnerabilities inherent in being fully dependent on technology for their own survival, as is the case with most people who live in the cities. So the survivalist who's on this boat, say, which is increasingly getting more and more powerful, this barge, which is absorbing the riches and and all the things from the, the places that it visits, the prepper on that ship is saying, you know, well, what if this, this ship, this is great and everything. We got all this amazing technology. We're discovering all these wonderful things. But what if this ship sinks? You know, then we're going to be screwed. So that's a, a deep-seated understanding of the vulnerability which comes. There's a sharp contrast with how technologically dependent you are and how vulnerable you truly become in the absence of that technology. We no longer have the fur that kept us warm in the winter time. We no longer have the claws and the teeth to chew raw meat. I mean, we are dependent on technology and that's a process that has occurred over tens of thousands of years, but it's been intensely magnified in the last 200 years and even more so arguably in the last 20 years. It's, there's a telescoping nature of evolution. We become exponentially more dependent. So survivalists generally have this pessimistic view of the resiliency of civilization and its ability to deal with the many challenges, be they economic, ecological, or geopolitical. But conversely, we are very optimistic in our ability to endure any calamity which may befall us. And so this is where the irrationality of survivalism comes in, is that we are pessimistic of the resiliency of civilization, but we aren't pessimistic about our ability to deal with the collapse of that civilization. Now, on the flip side, there's an equal irrational behavior from people who are not of the preparedness mindset. And that's that they are very optimistic about civilization 
always, you know, being too big to fail. But they're very pessimistic about their own capabilities of survival. And you see this in the fatalism of the non-prepper trolls who come on the channel. And they'll say things like, ah, well, I wouldn't want to survive in a world like that anyways. And a lot of that is a defense mechanism because they realize how daunting of a task it is to actually have to prepare for something like that or to, to be self-reliant that they just say, well, I wouldn't want to survive in a world like that anyways, or, or it's just not possible to survive in that world is what they would say. The philosophical underpinnings of survivalism are longing to retain some autonomy in the face of an increasingly invasive, uh, increasingly addictive, codependent technological grid that we are firmly hardwired to exponentially more day after day. Now there's some similarities between survivalism and existentialism. Existentialism is the idea that, you know, Nietzsche said his famous quote, God is dead. Now, before you start attacking me, because I know I have a lot of Christian viewers out there and I love you all to death, but that was his philosophy. Okay. He thought that mankind was doomed to make sense of the world, that bad things happened, that we lived in a chaotic universe and we were doomed to create our own ethics and morals and we were burdened with this task of free will and there was no overarching good or evil. That's existentialism. Now it's more morphed its way into like postmodernism. There is no truth. Uh, there's definitely that humanistic element to survivalism because the survivalist is very much a person who wants to be in control of their destiny. They want not to be told what to do. So when we find ourselves in this increasingly hyper technologically dependent society, we necessarily have less autonomy. We have less free will. Even if you, you think, oh, I can just go and Google anything. You, you are still uh, locked in, in so many other ways. I mean, you know, you have to have a, a license to drive a car and you have to have, uh, you know, an internet connection from a licensed internet provider and you have to, you know, use one of five search engines and there's an illusion of choice there. You're operating within a, a larger program, just kind of like if you were a, a video game character in a game, you operate within the rules of that game. That's kind of what society and civilization is. The prepper in many ways wants to be totally free from that because there's something authentically human about being free from technology. So survivalism isn't just some moron running around the woods, shooting at targets with his AR-15, waiting for the zombie apocalypse so he can prove how much of a man he is. It's far more complicated than that. That guy might not realize it, but what he's truly longing for is agency. He's truly longing for the ability to make his own decisions, to, to have full responsibility for his life, to be free, to be free from the oppressiveness of technology, which was supposed to liberate us. So there's definitely a humanistic element to survivalism in that it, in almost all cases, it involves arresting the technological development or the complete regression of technological development because that's the thing with a survivalist you're not a thrivalist you're not progressive not in the not in the political sense you're not progressive in the technological sense the survivalist assumes that technology is susceptible to collapse and that it it cannot be relied upon and that therefore it's going to stop progressing so essentially it's kind of stagnant, which is basically why you have a situation like the Amish, you know, who live in this uh, state of development, which is self-imposed. It's, you know, they obviously could integrate more elements of modern, the modern world if they wanted to, but they choose not to. But in many cases, that's what the prepper tries to do. Although uh, the prepper, as opposed to the Amish, tries to integrate the high point of technology today because technology is a good thing. I'm not a Luddite, I'm not anti-technology, but I think I am certainly pro-human agency. 
And I think anybody could agree on that. You don't have to be a conservative or liberal to want free will and to want to have choice. And that's part of the problem. And what I've always said is that, generally speaking, uh, people on the left fear power in the hands of corporations and people on the right fear, fear power in the hands of governments. That's really the crux of it all from a fiscal perspective anyways. So in most cases, survivalism involves a downgrade in the standard of living as it's viewed as being less vulnerable to what some believe is the inevitable collapse. So you living out in a cabin in the woods, the world collapses around you, you don't notice. People living in a third world country who are still, you know, living like the Kalahari Bushmen or whatever, uh, they don't notice if the world collapses. Their, their, their lives go on like business as usual. Everybody else sure as hell notices because all of their skills, their survival skills have atrophied. Their thrival skills are off the charts, but their survival skills are not. See, the modern man is really a, a thrivalist, particularly the corporatist or the entrepreneur. And even as myself doing some entrepreneurial stuff with Canadian preparedness and YouTube, I get the sense that, you know, I am very much a part of the problem because the problem with thrivalism is that it is essentially why crap is going to hit the fan because we're operate, operating within a finite system and everybody wants infinite growth. All of this affords those practicing those survivalist methods, more agency and responsibility over their lives thereby producing a greater sense of pride in their accomplishments, even if they are generally less productive than what they would yield off the grid. So even though you're, you know, you don't have the new video game system every six months, you still have an overall net gain in pleasure because as everybody knows, more is not always more. Oftentimes more is less. Now, I think most people are familiar with the data that shows that, you know, the more money you make doesn't equate to a greater amount of happiness. I think there's, it's kind of like a curve, you know, so you, you're, you're kind of happy right when you, you have enough to survive. If you have too much, then, you know, it's more money, more problems is a real thing. So that's where survivalism chooses a more minimalist lifestyle, like the tiny home movement and things of that nature. You could probably lump all those things under the umbrella of survivalism in some way, shape or form. Uh, just the off grid movement in general. They all recognize that that true pleasure, pleasure really requires some element of, of risk. And uh, there's an Alan Watt quote, which says that, let's say you could go to sleep and you could dream 75 years of your life and you could dream whatever you wanted to. First, you would go in the first night, you'd fulfill all of your fantasies. You know, everything would be absolutely perfect. There would be nothing that was unpredictable within it. The next night you'd say to yourself, well, tonight, you know, last night was great. I dreamt 75 years. I fulfilled all my fantasies, but tonight I'm gonna try something a bit more risky. So you maybe throw in a few risks. You live your life and you come out and you're like, wow, that was a close shave, as he says. And the next night you do the same thing and you add a few more risks because, you know, to live a life without any risk is kind of boring eventually, even if everything is perfect. So anyways, you know, you, you keep doing this night after night until eventually you would be dreaming the life you had now. You would essentially be dreaming the life with all of the challenges and tribulations of what you had right now. So I don't know where I was going in mentioning that. I'll post a link to that Alan Watt video below. Anyways, ultimately survivalism seeks to preserve human free will in an increasingly technologically deterministic world. That's what I think survivalism is. It's not just about you surviving for the simple sake of surviving by yourself, like some isolated, shut in. It can't just be for that. I mean, you really have to ask yourself, 
why do you want to survive? Like, why? What, what world do you want to bring forth out of this one afterwards, if this one does collapse? It can't just be to eat rations all day and hide from marauders. I mean, how stupid would that be? How, how pointless of an existence would that be? Clearly, we are destined for more. There's definitely something about human beings which is expansive. The problem is, is that we're doing it all wrong right now. And, you know, maybe the deck just needs to be reshuffled. And that may be a time of, dare I say, great tribulation. And, you know, who's going to come out on top is one question. But why should you come on top is another you know, why should you survive and somebody else not? And I'm not just saying because, yeah, the desire is to preserve yourself. Your being matters most. But why? What are you going to do for the cause of the human race after that? You must believe that there's some greater purpose for human beings than just to remain in the current state that we're in. Anyways, guys, that's my definition of survivalism in a nutshell. It's a movement. I don't like using the term movement because that's kind of culty. And I'm certainly the furthest thing from a cult leader. Or at least I don't want to be a cult leader. Let's make that abundantly clear. But survivalism is something that emerges in direct response to the increasingly uh, perceived and actual technological oppression of the modern age. Anyways, let me know what you think in the comment section. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this YouTube channel is to support yourself by gearing up through CanadianPreparedness.com or BugOutRoll.ca. Premium quality gear at the best possible price using the incredibly secure and easy to use Shopify platform. We offer free shipping to the United States for orders over $200 USD and free shipping to Canada over $75. So support the channel by supporting yourself.